Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 185. Today's big Bible question, why did Jesus tell his disciples to be as shrewd as serpents? So happy Tuesday, friends. Today we are reading Joshua chapter 2, Psalms 123, 124, and 125, Isaiah 62, and Matthew chapter 10. Our big Bible question is a strange one, to be sure, one that's had me scratching my head before. In Matthew 10, Jesus sends out his disciples all across Israel to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast demons out, and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Surprisingly, As part of their instructions, Jesus orders the disciples to be as, quote, shrewd as serpents. This is surprising for a couple of major reasons. Number one, because, you know, shrewdness or craftiness or whatever doesn't seem to be something that Jesus would particularly esteem. And number two, Genesis 3 tells us that the serpent in the Garden of Eden, i.e. the devil, was the craftiest of all the creatures in the garden. And that doesn't seem like a good trait to emulate nor a good person to follow. So when I get to a verse like this one that I struggle to understand what is being communicated, the first thing I do is to read the surrounding passage and look for clues as to the meaning and the context of all the verses around it. So let's do that first and go read Matthew chapter 10, and then we'll discuss our second step. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Summoning his twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Jesus sent out these twelve after giving them instructions. Don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles, and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim... The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Don't acquire gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it, and if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of them, because they will hand you over to the local courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you are to speak, for you will be given what to say at that hour. Because it isn't you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father is speaking through you. Brother will betray brother brother to death and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved." When they prosecute, persecute you in one town, flee to another. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, or a slave above his master. It is enough for a disciple to become like his teacher, and a slave like his master. If they called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. Therefore don't be afraid of them, since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows." Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, 
A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. The one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. And the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he's righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. So the context of the passage is that Jesus, as I said, is sending his disciples out into a dangerous situation and he's giving them a warning of sorts. So that's helpful information But it doesn't quite answer our question yet, i.e., what does it actually mean to be as shrewd as a serpent? So step number two in understanding passages like this, at least for me, is to go to the original language and look up what it says in the Greek for the New Testament. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to be a big Greek scholar to do this work either. A website like BibleHub.com or BlueLetterBible.org will help because what you can do there is you can go up and look at those Greek words and see where they appear in other passages. In other words, you'll see how those words are used in other passages, and very often that can illuminate the passage you're wondering about. So in this particular case, there are really two main words that will help us understand this command of Jesus. The second most important word is the Greek word ophis, which just means serpent or snake exactly like you'd think it would. Not a lot of nuance there. An ophis is a snake. Now, that actually comes from a root uh, that we use words like ophthalmology and things like that. Uh, we think that an ophis was a snake in the Greek because it meant that it had sharp eyes. Maybe not in so much in the term, in terms of having great vision, but being extremely clever and shrewd, sharp eyed, in other words. But the most important word here is phronimos. And it has a great wide range of meanings. It can mean intelligent, wise, prudent, cautious, maybe even clever. It's the same exact word that appears several other times in Matthew. Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a phronimos man or a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew 24, 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time. Wise there is the word phronimos. Matthew 25, 1 tells us a parable of foolish virgins virgins, and phronimos virgins or wise virgins. So the other times the word is used, uh, the CSB, as we can tell, use, translates it as wise rather than shrewd. I think that's a pretty good choice, but we can look at Luke 16, to see why the translators went with shrewd in this particular context in Matthew 10. So let me just read a few verses out of Luke 16 for you. This is uh, another strange parable. This is a strange parable of Jesus that uh, seems to be saying one thing. And I think by the time we get to the end of this, we'll have a better understanding of what's going on. Luke 16 verse 1 says, Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who received an accusation that his manager was squandering his possessions. So he called the manager in and asked, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be my manager. Then the manager said to himself, oh, what will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Uh I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from management, people will welcome me into their homes. So he summoned each one of his master's debtors. How much do you owe my master? He asked the first one. A hundred measures of olive oil, he said. Take your invoice, he told him. Sit down quickly and write fifty. Next, he asked another, how much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. Take your invoice, he told him, and write eighty. The master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. There's that word there, the phronimos word. For the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of light in dealing with their own people. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth, so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. So that's a pretty interesting parable, right? And it brings us to kind of a unsettling question, doesn't it? 
is Jesus telling his disciples to be dishonestly crafty or deceptive or, you know, kind of clever like a cat burglar? Now, the answer could actually be yes, just in the context of the words. We know the character of Jesus that the answer is not yes. But in the context of the words, it could be yes, except for one crucial detail. Jesus doesn't just command his disciples to be as shrewd as snakes. He also commands them to be what? Yes, you got it. As innocent as doves a paradoxical statement to his first one. And herein, I think we find the essence of what Jesus is saying. Be clever, but not deceptively clever. Be shrewd, but not dishonestly shrewd. Be wise, but not selfishly wise. Be smart, but not in a sinful way. That's a very practical command that is also holy. Christians aren't called to be foolish or dumb or dim-witted or to invite trouble upon themselves by their foolhardiness and their stupidity. They are called, we are called to be innocently clever, crafty with integrity, cunning but not in a harmful or self-serving way. I think Pastor Tim Keller rightly captures the essence of this command well, and he says this, No matter how compassionate you are, no matter what you do, since you are telling people the truth, you're calling them to repentance, you know, there's going to be pushback and there can even be persecution. Now, a couple of shoes have to drop. Notice in verse 23, Jesus says, when you are persecuted in one place, go to another. That's very practical. Or Matthew 10, verse 16, when he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. That would be a good sermon right there. Isn't it amazing, says Keller? What he's saying is, of course, I want you to be innocent. I don't want you to lie. That's innocent as doves. But be shrewd. Don't be unnecessarily offensive. Think about what you're saying. Be careful. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be hostility. Don't make it worse. Don't seek it. Don't invite it. Don't, you know, in other words, don't be a stupid jerk that people are just going to dislike, not because of your message pointing people to Jesus, but because you're just, you know, a boob. Don't do that. No, Keller continues. The key point, though, is verse 22. All men will hate you because of me. By the way, what that means is make sure they hate you because of Jesus, not because you're not true, not because you're stupid, not because you actually don't leave when you're being told to. Verse 23 says, if they're angry with you, don't just sit there and say, oh, I feel so noble when I'm being persecuted. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to be so valiant for truth that I'm going to despise all the other Christians who aren't as persecuted as me. None of that, says Keller. This passage doesn't breathe anything like that martyr complex. But here's the point. Verse 22 says, All men will hate you because of me. Jesus isn't saying that every single human being hates Jesus and will hate Christians. Why would there be any Christians if that's what he was saying? Obviously, people can be attracted too. What he's saying is, is this. My offensiveness is pervasive and strong across the face of the human race. And if you identify with me, you're going to catch a lot of heat. Now, why is Jesus so offensive? Here's a couple of reasons why he's offensive. One, he's offensive because of the enormous nature of his claims. Jesus is always saying things like, before Abraham was, I am, taking the divine name for himself. Or he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Just casually mentioning that, you know, I've been around from all eternity. Or when he says, on the last day, on judgment day, People will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this or that? In other words, everyone on Judgment Day is going to come to him. That's his claim. He's the judge of all the earth. He created the world. He's the God of the world. He's the judge of the world. Now, when you have claims like that, what does that do? The reason it's offensive is that it pushes people. Nobody wants this, but his claims push you to extremes. The only way to be consistent is to be extreme in your response to him. You either have to say, I have to live completely for him. He has to be the highest priority of my life. He has to be the reason I get up in the morning. Every single decision I make, everything I do should be done to please and honor him. Either I do that or I need to run away from this man screaming, screaming because I'm angry at him for being such a liar or just, you know, screaming in general. Keller says, In Flannery O'Connor's great short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, the central character is the misfit. He's a criminal and he's killing people. At one point, he explains why he's so mean. He says, 
Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, and he shouldn't have done it. That threw everything off balance. If he did what he said he did, in other words, if he's responsible for the miracles the Bible attributes to him, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can, by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. Keller says that is a more consistent response to the claims of Jesus Christ than to just come to church and say, oh, I believe in him, but I'm not going to center my whole life on him. He's offensive. Jesus is offensive because he forces us to extremes. That's what the misfit in O'Connor's story said. If he did what he said he did, there's nothing for us to do but throw everything away and follow him. That's radical. That's offensive. And you bet it is, friends. And That presents you and I with a choice. Are we going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly with every fiber of our being, or are we going to run away screaming from him because his claims are too great for us to imagine? And here's the thing, there's no middle ground. Follow him, give your life to him, and enjoy eternal life in heaven by faith in him, or run away screaming and find your own way and find out what that's like when he returns. Let's keep reading. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, saying, Go and scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left, and they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent Rahab word and said, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they came to investigate the entire land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, so she said, Yes, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. At nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out, and I don't know where they were going. Chase after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them among the stalks of flax that she had arranged on the roof. The men pursued them along the road to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as they left to pursue them, the city gate was shut. Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my father's family because I showed kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, my brothers, my mother, my sisters, and all who belong to them and save us from death. The men answered her, We will give our lives for yours if you don't report our mission. We will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us all the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, since she lived in a house that was built into the wall of the city. Go to the hill country so that the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide for three days until they return. Afterward, go on your way. The men said to her, We will be free from this oath you made us swear, unless when we enter the land you tie this scarlet cord to the window through which you let us down. Bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. If anyone goes out the doors of your house, his death will be his own fault, and we will be innocent. But if anyone with you in the house should be harmed, his death will be our fault. And if you report our mission, we are free from the oath you made us swear. Let it be as you say, she replied. And she sent them away. After they had gone, she tied the scarlet cord to the window. So the two men went into the hill country and stayed there three days until the pursuers had returned. They searched all along the way, but they did not find them. Then the men returned, came down from the hill country, and crossed the Jordan. They went to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported everything that had happened to them. They told Joshua, The Lord has handed over the entire land to us. Everyone who lives in the land is also panicking because of us. Psalm chapter 123, verse 1, I lift my eyes to you, the one enthroned in heaven, like a servant's eyes on his master's hand, like a servant girl's eyes on her mistress's hand, so our eyes are on the Lord our God until he shows his favor. Show us favor, Lord, show us favor, for we've had more than enough contempt. We've had more than enough scorn from the arrogant and contempt from the proud. Psalm chapter 124. 
If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, then they would have swallowed us alive in their burning anger against us. Then the water would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging water would have swept over us. Blessed be the Lord who has not let us be ripped apart by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the hunter's net. The net is torn and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. It cannot be shaken. It remains forever. The mountains surround Jerusalem and the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous will not apply their hands to injustice. Do what is good, Lord, to the good, to those whose hearts are upright, But as for those who turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord will banish them with evildoers. Peace be with Israel. Isaiah 62 verse 1, I will not keep silent because of Zion, and I will not keep still because of Jerusalem, until her righteousness shines like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be given a new name that the Lord's mouth will announce. You will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God's hand. You will no longer be called deserted, and your land will not be called desolate. Instead, you will be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land will be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you, and as a groom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen on your walls. They were never, they will never be silent day or night. There is no rest for you who remind the Lord. Do not give him rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem the praise of the earth. The Lord is sworn with his right hand and his strong arm. I will no longer give your grain to your enemies for food, and foreigners will not drink the new wine for which you have labored. For those who gather grain will eat it and praise the Lord. And those who harvest the grapes will drink the wine in my holy courts. Go out, go out through the city gates, prepare a way for the people, build it up, build up the highway, clear away the stones, raise a banner for the peoples. Look, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, say to daughter Zion, look, your salvation is coming. His wages are with him and his reward accompanies him. And they will be called the holy people, the Lord's redeemed and you will be called careful, cared for, a city not deserted. Amen. Let it be. Come, Lord Jesus. Good day to you, friends, and Godspeed.